Why do incels love Cormac McCarthy so much? And in today's video, we're not going to take the easy way out and be like, well, Cormac writes characters like Lester Ballard, which is a reflection of the proto-incel. No, and we also are not going to turn this into a liberal. Cormac McCarthy is having his work turned into alt-right propaganda by incelers. But rather, today, we are going to look at this from a practical point of view because for the last 16 years, I have been reading Cormac McCarthy. I have attended multiple Cormac McCarthy conferences. I have talked to hundreds of you guys, if not thousands at this point, about Cormac McCarthy. And I just have to say, the incel community here is strong. I've been to multiple Hemingway conferences, Native American fiction conferences, and a bunch of other literature type events and spent eight years in academia. And I can tell you guys that Cormac McCarthy fans are a breed of their own. And you guys can throw me in that category of weird, eccentric, out of touch individuals who love Cormac McCarthy. And if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to Cormac McCarthy on YouTube. There down in the playlist in the description is 150 videos I've already done on Cormac McCarthy. And I'm planning on doing thousands of more in the future. And I would love to have you along with me on this journey. So let's talk about the initial reason why men are attracted to Cormac McCarthy. And we have to go back to my boy Hemingway to be able to get into this. Have, you, have any of you guys ever heard of Hemingway's iceberg theory? Well, it talks about how Hemingway's prose at the top is the top of the iceberg, what you can see, but it's only a small part of the iceberg. And that's the narrative, the plot, the dialogue, and some of the minimalistic elements. And then, then at the bottom, which comprises most of the structure, are the implied elements, the thoughts, the feelings, the motives, the symbolism. And Hemingway's minimalistic style is pretty easy to read. But then when you go to, for instance, Hemingway conferences or read Hemingway scholarship, they come up with the most insane theories you could ever imagine. And you're sitting there and as you're reading it, you're like, wait, these people are right. This is way too, inc too coincidental for Hemingway just to have places in here. And there's all these symbols and stuff. And that's why I love Hemingway scholarship because it's endless. And the same goes for Cormac McCarthy scholarship. McCarthy at times mimics Hemingway's minimalistic style, but then expands into nature, into more scientific or modern things, and also has a much more elevated use of prose, which lends itself to this analysis of symbols at a deeper level. For instance, layered throughout Blood Meridian, there are slight references to Gnostic symbols that you might just be reading as some gibberish random word that Cormac McCarthy found in the Oxford English Dictionary in book five, page 348, but it's alluding to something else that connects to something that's mirrored in another part of the novel. And the same goes for the, his entire career. On my Cormac McCarthy course, I did a 10-hour Orchard Keeper analysis. And as I was reading the book, I read it over 10 times in a couple months, I was shocked that a 28-year-old Cormac McCarthy knew how to layer this deeply and cared so much about symbolism. And that's one of the merits of the Orchard Keeper is that he's actually very aggressive with his symbolism. And so us men, and incels are men, so we're focusing first of all on men and then we're going to weasel our way down to the incels. We love to fix things, we love to investigate. If there's a code to be cracked, if there's something to build, something to do, we wanna be a part of it. And that's what pulls us toward guys like Hemingway and Cormac McCarthy. And obviously both Hemingway and McCarthy have very male-centric bibliographies and male-centric kind of character focuses. There are very few female characters in Cormac McCarthy novels. The three main ones are Alejandra in All the Pretty Horses, Alicia in Stella Maris, and then Rinthi in Outer Dark. And when you look at all of them, they don't have that much of a presence, don't have that much of a personality, and give us basically nothing. But that's further on down the iceberg. But at the core level, and now moving toward talking about incels, incels are very self-conscious individuals. They feel that when it comes to the modern dating world, most women are very superficial. And I would agree, but then add, when you look at most men, they are very superficial. Like my neighbor, he has a man cave. He avoids his wife and his kids unless he's like screaming at them. And he just is watching football, WWE. And when I have to talk to him just friendly, you know, in a friendly manner, he's one of the most fake people I've ever known. So obviously the correct assertion is to say that most people in the world are superficial because our consensual reality and what we're being primed to like and to do is very superficial because to all become independent free thinkers would mean that government and a lot of the institutions would collapse because there would be no more need for them and people would lose pensions. There's a whole system upholding consensual reality. But incels have a harder time because it depends on 
what study or what stats you want to look at, but the numbers are eerily similar that most women, when asked and shown a big group of men at all different ages and skin tones or you know skin colors and attractiveness, whatever, find around 20% of men attractive. And then when we look on the opposite end, men find anywhere from 60 to 80%. And these numbers, you know, the women could be 15 to 25%. I've looked at a bunch of these studies. Men find 60 to 80% of women attractive. And I just want to say right now, there's going to be someone out there, that's biological. That's a 60% gap is not biological. That's actually social conditioning. I don't know by how much. I don't know how much of that percentage is social conditioning, but it's a lot of it. Not to go full red black pill on, on everyone too early into the program. But a lot of the gripes that incels have are true because women have a much easier time finding dating prospects than men do. Most women could walk into a bar and do next to nothing and have a whole group of men with them. Or excuse me, almost every single man in the bar want to take them home. But if a man walks into a bar with, let's say, or a club or something with a lot of women, he is going to have to get lucky. And unless he's like a very high quality male, it's going to be next to impossible just to get one person to go home with them. And that's all whatever. And that's for people who are playing the game. You know, I don't really believe in the stuff and don't really care because there are ways to circumnavigate the dating world by just improving yourself. But we'll kind of get into that later. But what this creates is a situation where these incels become very self-conscious. And as I've talked about on the program many times before, the epidemic of overthinking is this epidemic of self-consciousness, being aware of the awareness, but not really knowing what to do about it in a very meditative way. So we are aware of our awareness and then we're stuck in these little houses and in these jobs and looking at these people online. And if you are an kind of not very attractive, somewhat eccentric, weird type male, just kind of genetically and just how you were raised, you really aren't going to have a very good chance with women. You're not going to be able to connect with them. And then your self-consciousness, that's maybe your ability, maybe your ancestry and your genetics and your place in the world is to kind of be more of like the coyote. You're not the alpha uh, wolf. You're kind of the more thinking coyote, but there's no space for that anymore because in that self-consciousness, you can't get with superficial women. Like I can't do that. Like I have friends and they can go out to the bar and get with women who are as the dumb as a pile of rocks. I know women who are smart who can just go get with any dumb dude with a truck or like cowboy and they just they love it. And they're pretty successful people. They have no conscious self-consciousness about that. But then there are people like me and I can't get past five minutes of a conversation. If someone is superficial or like kind of weird, I like self-destruct the conversation and leave. And so incels have this problem where they're genetically kind of self-conscious and then they're in a reality that is building this insane self-consciousness and it's and within the multiplication, we get this really gr weird group of people. But what self-consciousness creates is emotionality. What it does is, of course, to build icebergs within our mind. And the iceberg could be said to be just repression. And so all this trauma, not being able to communicate and engage in communities and go through kind of the typical dating program, which is supposed to make men better. Because all of us, I'm sure you guys, if I got taught to your 16-year-old self, if you're in high school, I don't know, you're kind of weird, right? You're kind of out there. But eventually, as you enter the dating scene, you kind of align with women and they're your dyadic opposite. And you melt together and then a lot of, those, a lot of that kind of weirdness melts away. But what happens if you don't do that? What happens if you uh, don't get laid by the time college is over, which means that you just totally avoided like being, like talking to people, if, especially if you were trying? Then a lot of these little quirks are never ironed out. And so the iceberg continues to grow. And they, every single night, you know, I feel bad for incels because you have to go home. And I've been there. You guys have been lonely before. Maybe you're an incel. You have to go home every single night. And think about everyone else out in the world who has someone, or at least has a prospect of having someone. And you're at ground zero. You are like, not just at the base camp of Mount Everest, you're over here in America and got to get a flight over there and you're broke. And so how does this relate to Cormac McCarthy? So we, McCarthy has this pantheon of male characters with zero interiority. What McCarthy refuses to do in almost every single one of his novels, if not every single one of them, is provide interiority to the characters. And so... Our job as a reader is to find, is to once again dive deep into this investigation of what is going on. But in that investigation, we project our own feelings onto McCarthy. I obviously do this all the time. There was a comment yesterday saying, you just see Cormac McCarthy through pagan individuality, and you don't see the Christian point of view. And the same could be said about any lonely man that's reading McCarthy's works. But it's multiplied by multiple times because McCarthy's works connect to all these 
romanticized past of the incel. First of one being loneliness. A lot of incels are sitting at home on the computer all day or working a job in their parents' basement. I know, uh, I know an incel. I know one, everyone. And he's in his 30s, had big dreams, and he's still in his parents' basement, still a virgin. And it's honestly a really sad situation. And there's nothing positive to be found there. But when we look at McCarthy's works and most of his novels, we see these characters who are also lonely. John Wesley Ratner and Ombi in The Orchard Keeper, Cola in Outer Dark, Lester Ballard in Child of God, Sutri, Harrigan, most of the characters in Sutri, most of the Glanting Gang, especially the kid in kind of the early moments when he's wandering by himself, John Grady Cole, Billy Parham in The Border trilogy. Even Anton Chigurh, Lonely Man. The Boy in the Sun in the Road, Bobby Western, Alicia. You guys kind of get the picture. McCarthy's novels really aren't about this idea of community. And what are these characters doing? Well, they're most of the time spending a lot of time in nature, which connects to this pastoral idea that uh, red pillars and insults kind of look back at. And this is why Blood Meridian is so popular, is that they wish for a time where they could have autonomy, where they could go out into the world. And because of barbed wire fences and capitalism and societal expectation, societal expectations, rambling men aren't maybe seen as positively. And to be a rambling man requires capital. And a lot of rambling men jobs, like I know a lot of ramblers and they work as wildlife firefighters during the summer. And then in the winter, they do all types of jobs. I have a buddy, and he does that every single summer. Then he does weird things like oil rigging in Alaska in the winter or coming down to Arizona and working in these like little tiny mines trying to find quartz or something. And he lives this romantic life, but he's a capable. He's capable. He's attractive. He's confident. He can get women. But Judge Holden, we are fascinated by him unconsciously because we wish we had that type of autonomy. We've all had fantasies of being able to go out into the world and do whatever we want. These delusions of grandeur of what we would do with power and fame. And that's the mentality that Holden is living out there because he's obviously involved in the pursuit of money and women and power and all these other things. But then when we look at the Border Trilogy, it takes us back to the teenage years because that's when a lot of problems begin for a lot of these characters. But this is a divergent path. These characters in their loneliness have an opportunity to try and make their way through the world. And McCarthy goes kind of black pill with a lot of his characters, though, because what they are met with is kind of this fatalistic world where it seems like there's this biological determinism and defeatism that supports kind of their, oh, boo-hoo, look at me, like I can't ever get with anybody mentality. And all these lonely characters I talked about, none of them have a happy ending. Maybe Sutri does. But other than that, they are experiencing and being terrorized and being torn down by by the other kind of fascination of the incels. And this is kind of connecting to Ted Kaczynski's philosophy, talking about technology and this oncoming world that's destroying our power to be individuals. And from moment one in The Orchard Keeper, McCarthy, literally the first paragraph, first couple of paragraphs McCarthy ever writes are a scathing critique of civilization and of technology. And when you ask incels or people who are kind of in this red pill, black pill space about where did all this come from? what, Who's controlling this? What's the main problem? And it is the oncoming civilization. And once civilization is here, once the industrial revolution kicks off, then we get technology, then we get control, then we have these massive power There's this massive power that can be directed toward kind of these old age ways. And so I would assume the common insult is fascinated by characters that are doing a little bit better than them, are a little bit more capable than them. They kind of go out on these romantic journeys and are living this life that they want to live, but then are met with their, with an ultimate demise because of civilization and technology. This technology and civilization that is very brutal, that you know harms nature in the crossing and honestly harms innocent humans all throughout the Border Trilogy. This nature that drives governments to create scalp bounties in Blood Meridian. And why are the Comanche down here? Oh, because they got pushed out of Montana or Wyoming, wherever they were, because of government. You know, there are these critiques all throughout McCarthy's novels about government and civilization. And as an insult, you can kind of just read that at a plain level and not kind of go deeper into why McCarthy is doing it. I don't necessarily think that McCarthy is anti-technology. I think that if McCarthy was born today, he'd be participating on the internet, maybe more in scientific ways. And I'm sure if he understood it, he'd be into the complex models and systems that computers can bring to things in science. And obviously he was attending presentations at the Santa Fe Institute and looking into science that would never be possible without the use of technology or computers. But the next reason on our list is where we get a little bit weird. 
And that's the sexual aspect of McCarthy's literature. And there are two different angles. Well, there are multiple angles of this. First of all, there is the incestual angle. There's the underage angle. And then there's kind of the absence of women angle. And all three of those, one could say, lend themselves to kind of the fantasies and fetishes and weirdness of the incel movement. Because if you get a man and you stick him in a house or in an environment and he never is able to interact with women and grow out of it and he's on you know immersed in this online world that's connected to porn and all these other things what's going to happen to him he's going to become weird he's going to start to develop these kind of predilections that aren't healthy forgot to mention necrophilia in regards to mccarthy anyway so there's underage sex in the orchard keeper there is incest in outer dark there is weird sexual stuff in child of god there's underage sex and exploitation in suchry there's underage sex and rape and pedophilia in blood meridian there is rape in all the pretty horses of an underage man i i'm not, I'm not gonna say who not gonna spoil here there is underage love in the crossing there's underage love and consummation in cities of the plain there is something weird in no country for old men that i can't remember right now i think at I'm, uh, this one always slips my mind but there's something in no country for old men there's obviously cannibalism and rape in the road and there is obviously incest once again in the passenger and stella mars all right because it is implied that they actually got with each other and maybe even were, uh, bobby got alicia pregnant and maybe they had to abort that baby that's what was implied and was what was said actually so did you guys just hear everything I just said? That's every single novel. McCarthy somehow managed in every single one of his books to include something really weird in it. And I don't think McCarthy is an incel. I think he does these things because they're good literary techniques. They add contrast and weirdness to a story, which then helps him catapult into different values and ideas. And he contrasts that and layers it. It's all really good stuff from a writing point of view of like how you make something more interesting. And I love that McCarthy's not scared to kind of engage in these things. But once again, it does get an affirmation to some of these guys' consciousness because like I said, it can go in different ways. I don't know how these people react, but obviously some of them are predators of young women. Some of them have negative opinions of women. And this also lends itself to the absence of women in McCarthy's novels. We have Alejandra, we have Alicia, we have Renty, and probably someone else that I'm missing, but there's n not much action going on with women in McCarthy's novels. And when there are, they are, excuse me, they're very silent. They kind of put up and shut up, you know, Alicia doesn't obviously, but Rinty kind of does. And Alicia probably would too. If Bobby, you know, told her, hey, I love you and I'm going to take care of this. She'd probably go along with whatever he wanted. And so who knows where this stems from psychologically? One could say this is how Cormac was with his women. Cormac had three different wives and demanded out of them kind of unreal expectations. His first wife saying, hey, you're working 40 hours a week and you just had a baby a couple weeks ago. You need to go get a second job, even though that you're even though you're also a writer who got the same degree from, as me, I'm going to sit home and write all day and I'll take care of the kid, but you have to go work 60, 70 hours a week. And she was like, what the hell? No way I'm doing this. His second wife, he was living in poverty with her and wouldn't um, find different ways to make money. And eventually she was like, you know, giving him so much crap that he left her. And then his third wife, I'm assuming, eventually became too burdensome for him also. And once again, this is multiplied by the idea that men have no interiority, that men treat these women and can go through life without having to actually do anything, without actually having to feel, because self-consciousness is not the same as feeling. Sitting and getting anxiety and being weird and in your head all day doesn't mean that you're having emotions. You may go through this wide range of emotions, but you're not actually developing real things like love. Love is the most important emotion and feeling from the heart, being authentic. And when you're in your head too much, you're not able to do that. And we're never in these characters' heads, in their hearts, or in their emotions. Sometimes we see them wear it on their sleeves like John Grady Cole does in All the Pretty Horses. Maybe a little bit of Alicia and Bobby, but most of the time it's very muted. So moving on, so we talked about sex. Now we need to obviously discuss violence. And I don't know if you guys saw the documentary TFW No GF by Alex Lee Moyer. But it's a documentary, and it's not the best documentary. I'd probably give it a 5 out of 10, 6 out of 10 maybe at most. I mean, it has a lot of problems. Kind of documenting Doomer culture, incel culture in America back in 2020 is, I think, when it came out. It has some good interviews. Like, one of my favorite clips I always play on the channel is of this guy, Kantbot, who talked about how Trump was going to complete the system that of German idealism that Schelling and Helling, uh, Hegel started. I'll play a little bit for you right now. introduction to the philosophy of mythology. Schelling is a German idealist philosopher. He was roommates with Holderlin and with Hegel. And he talks about all of this. He predicted it a long time ago. 
Trump is going to make German idealism real. He's going to complete the system. Kant, he could not complete the system of German... Right, conscious could not complete the system of German idealism. Idealism. Trump is going to complete the system. He's going to derive the complete system. That was terrifying, you, right? That terrifies you, right? It terrifies me. How can we complete the system of German idealism? How do we never do it? I don't know. No one could do it. Hegel couldn't do it. Schelling couldn't do it. Fichte couldn't do it. Reinhold couldn't do it. Maman couldn't do it. No one could complete the system of German idealism. And honestly, that's kind of some fire that he's spewing right there, even though he's saying Trump's going to do it, obviously. But he was talking about how Trump was going to bring the ideal into reality and bring us to this new level of consciousness, with, which German idealists kind of proselytize. And we never have really got there. We've never been able to bring the ideal into reality. So, you know, and so and he's talking, obviously, some people have no idea what the hell he's saying. But he was in the incel documentary as kind of this uh, thought leader, if one could say that, of the incels, of the Chan boards of the philosophical uh, segment of that. And he used to be on YouTube. His name was Kantbot. He was talking about philosophy and stuff. I, who, who the hell knows where, where he's at now. But the reason I mentioned this documentary and Kantbot, even though I love to mention Kantbot in this clip whenever I can, because this is how I feel sometimes when I'm talking to people about, you know, life and utopia and how like transcending Christianity or transcending any of these things and transcending government. Everyone, everyone's like, oh my God, what are you talking? It's like, yeah, we can do it. Maybe, or maybe I'm just as delusional as this guy. Anyway, what in that documentary, there are a lot of dudes, a lot of these repressed guys who are violent. They love guns. They're kind of the typical doomers. They're holding a lot of stuff in. And where does all this energy go? Because if you repress, if you iceberg, a lot of it has to go inward. And if you're having rage and resentment, especially against women, because women are supposed to calm you down. Women are supposed to be like, hey, no, Johnny, you're not, don't go and fight today. Like, don't do this. At least civilized women are, you know. Women could also be the greatest as we saw with Helen of Troy and other situations, the greatest creators of violence and instigate them into other things. You know, I, I, as a teacher in schools, I see women cause fights all the time. I should call them girls, cause fights at least once a month, if not once a week, um, but once a month directly related to the students in my class that I all know specifically. And obviously men cause fights way more than that, but women at their best are able to remove some of these violent tendencies from men. But I should also note, in regards to McCarthy's philosophy, that we're all violent by nature, and the really violent men, the men who act violent and are weird most of the time, I've known girls who've seen those dudes, it's kind of fixer-uppers. They see kind of these, maybe not incels, but proto-incels that have some confidence, but are this weird combination of ambitious in their careers, but don't like to work, and kind of grease monkey types, but then are like domestic abusers, as they find out later on. I've seen this happen like five separate times. So it actually can be very dangerous to like get with some of these men and women who think that that I shouldn't maybe promote that that's their job to help smooth things over because some of that time, you know, it, when it doesn't work, then the violence in the, the Sauron's eyes turn back toward you. And domestic abuse is the most underreported crime in the United States, which is a very, very sad thing. And so remember earlier I said that eventually you can cir you can circumnavigate the whole dating world. But to do that, you have to stop being childish. And what do children like? What do teenage boys like? They like violence. They like action movies and Marvel. And that's okay. But eventually, you have to at least be able to transcend that a little bit and get into more of some grown man mentality, you know, grown man mentality. But this love of violence, this love of putting, other da putting others down and being weird is not a very likable quality, but always kind of manifests with this inward resentment. And especially with technology, it's not just resentment, but you're stuck in these rooms and you're surrounding yourself with these people online and you're angry, not just about women, but society in general and everyone putting you here. And that is a quality that women can sniff a mile away. Talking about domestic abuse and stuff, when women see that you're repressed and weird, they want nothing to do with you. And so as I talked about earlier, most men and most women in the world are superficial. So as a man, if you are looking for a woman who is, in, is engaging in higher consciousness or has a growth-oriented mindset, you're only dealing with a small segment of the population. I, if I could, a generous amount would be 10%, which if we put the growth-oriented tag on it, it's, we could, I could range that from 5 to 10%. But some wacky math starts happening here. So we have 5 or 10% of females who are conscious. And then let's say there's five to 10% of men who are also conscious. And in a perfect world, they would all get together, right? And then produce conscious children. But what happens? There's two different angles. 
first of all, one being that unconscious men love to dominate un uh, conscious women, excuse me, more than anything. This is why there are so many bros out there like military men, or I shouldn't maybe throw them, but like, well, I could say men who aren't into growth oriented experiences, who aren't into understanding different phases of modality in terms of consciousness and way of life and thinking and learning. And they are with like hippie women. I've been a yoga teacher for 12 years now, and I've known a ton of women in the yoga community who are very spiritual. I'm like, wait, and I meet their husbands like, how the hell do you live with this guy? This dude is, as I talk about, is as dumb as a pile of rocks, man. He's also not very kind. He doesn't treat other people very well, but they have been overtaken by his persona, by his magnitude, by his money, or any of these different things. And it's a conquest for men to want to be able to get with these women because they're unattainable, right? They're, they're, they actually are higher beings. This kind of goes into the kind of the narcissist and empath relationship, but that the people with darkness, the people who are narcissistic in nature actually don't go for other narcissists or normal people. They shoot to the people with the most amount of light to suck out of them. And so these kind of very domineering men see this conquest and there's this, un this endless supply of conquest within these women because they are growing. And so they're going to be resisting. They're going to be like, no, no, no. But eventually, once you start being with someone, start having kids with someone, there seemingly is no escape. And so you kind of, these men kind of get this fix. So you have to deal with all of those guys. And a lot of time, those guys are very confident. They push with their ego. They are very forward. They sometimes are very successful, very attractive. And so they can swoop in and kind of get anybody that, you know, there's kind of that field of guys anyway, that kind of top five or 10% who can automatically swoop in and get with this group of people. So we have interference there. But then there's also the five to 10% of women. We have this group, and let's say there's some who are still remaining, which there are. Most of them are still remaining. A lot of them have gotten with high school sweethearts or just unconscious or with, you know, people who maybe aren't in the growth, men, uh, m growth mindset that they are, but they love them. They've been in a relationship with them for a long time or just kind of fallen into one. And so they're now occupied. So we're competing against these people. And then there are a lot of the great women and the great men are already taken in these kind of, we could say maybe not perfect relationships with people who are not functioning on, on the same growth mindset that they are. Okay, so then we have, we take away that segment. And then we're at the normal thing. So if you are one of the couple percent of women re remaining who is not going to be taken out by one of these kind of predator men, or you're not already in a relationship, then you have a lot to choose from. You can basically get with anybody and everyone. And so now we kind of have the societal conditioning taking part. Are they over six feet? Do they make over six figures? Are, are they attractive? Are they confident? Are they kind? Are they creative? And suddenly you're at this place where everything else has been removed and it's a big competition now where we have this 10% of men competing for this couple percent of these women. And so my advice to incels and to people of all time is don't focus on the now. Right now, if you're not successful in the, in the dating game, either you're not getting enough reps, you're not just putting yourself out there enough, but more likely you're not a high enough match that these women have this whole other group of men to look at that's much larger than the pool of women. And it's freaking competitive because you're competing with the growth oriented men. And I also forgot to mention that a lot of men also maybe aren't monogamous. A lot of this group of men that we're kind of discussing, what if they're just kind of going through women or just kind of engaging in short-term relationships. I know a guy, he breaks up with his girlfriends within six months. He's kind of one of these growth-oriented males, but he just kind of gets bored and moves on. But there are a lot of men like that who are kind of non-committal, taking up space too. And so if you're down the ladder for whatever reason, you it's a pipe dream that you're going to be able to compete and kind of be with a person that aligns with you. Maybe even a person that's at your same level because there's just so much competition that a lot of the people at your level are being swooped up. So are you going to settle with somebody less? Are you going to settle with someone that you don't want? And obviously the answer is no. And I'm not here to prescribe that you need to go do a dating course or you need to learn confidence or pick up artist tricks because that's not going to help you. Going to the bar more, any of that stuff, that's not where you find these high matches. Where are these high matches found? Or what are these high matches attracted to? You know, these good people that you want to be with. They're, first of all, attracted to people with good communication ability, people who are in touch with their emotions. And that's something that incels are not. And where do you get that? First of all, you get that out in nature. You get that by working on your mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual education. And if you take all four of those seriously, you're going to find yourself out in nature more. You're going to find yourself working out more, communicating with people more, and working on all those skills, educating yourself more. And you're automatically, just by that alone, going to be a more attractive, more well-spoken person with more things to talk about, which automatically is going to, when you uh, interact with one of these matches, make yourself a way, give yourself a way better chance. So 
I know the typical prescription is focus on yourself, but that's just step one. The second step is that you have to master something that is somewhat innovative and eccentric because I know a lot of men out there who are kind of these more incel types who haven't been with anyone yet and they're great engineers or they're great accountants or they're really great at analyzing literature, but that's not something that's very attractive. And when we're looking at this group of people, so, is, you know, cars aren't either, you know, a lot of, you know, there's kind of this kind of idealized version for maybe women who aren't as, and this is a generalization, we're making lots of generalizations, but, you know, the, the man fixing the truck, you know, the grease monkey or whatever, and that's fine. That's a practical thing to do. And that's a great hobby. And you should be able to fix your own car and do all that. But that's not something that's necessarily going to be appealing to this wide range of women in kind of this category that you're looking in. So you have to look and be like, okay, what's something that aligns with me that I'm interested in, but also aligns with a lot of these other, or excuse me, aligns with this category. And some things that I know are, you know, that I've been able to see are art, dance, music, yoga, poetry, spirituality, good uh, church, you know, stuff of like that, like stuff like that, good empathetic connection and being authentic in any of these things. Um, things like hiking, certain, you know, certain types of sports, unfortunately not Brazilian jiu-jitsu, skiing, like some of those fun things, but travel, uh, learning other languages, cooking, you know, th that's just, we, name some more things down below. But if you got really good at one of those things and even better, multiple of those things, if you became kind of a master or like had a high proficiency, imagine being a man who writes poetry and knows poetry very well. You can cook a stellar meal. You're really into travel and you also have a great yoga. You know, you're also really into yoga. That's something that over a 10 year time horizon, you have more than that's, you could get all that done in a year, honestly. You, that's that's doable in a year, but over 10 years, that's easily doable, five years. And then if you stack the deck on your side, and these are all things that are really good for you, you know, learning uh, how to play an instrument really well or learning to do art, um, especially if these things are kind of your passion, but you want to take it to the next level and not just doing it insularly, like doing it on an insular level, but doing your art and sharing it with others, like going to art fairs and talking about it or playing music live, taking yoga classes, uh, taking dance classes, inviting people to come eat at your house, hosting parties, you know, where you cook for people. Eventually, when you do enough of these things, that, that will help you rise above some of the guys who are in this growth oriented mindset who are just worried about like carnivore diet and hunting and like all these other things. And they're not really focused on things that are co-creative because that's what relationships are about. You want to be able to do stuff in a relationship with someone. Because if you meet someone and you're into travel and they're into travel, or if you are into learning languages and know Italian and they know Italian, boom, something you can automatically connect with. Same with cooking, or if they just really like someone who cooks for them. You kind of see what I'm saying here because you're kind of, it's a bad strategy in life to just be doing what you want to be doing and not thinking about what who do you want to meet. It's not the why, you know. Everyone talks about that dumb book, Start With Why, but it's really Start With Who. The reason I want to run right, right Conscious and not another channel is I actually love talking to people who are into books, who are into literature, into writing, like writers. I actually, most of the time, generally enjoy you guys as individuals. I don't enjoy athletes as much. I was really into athletics for a long time, but it re the who wasn't there. I didn't really want to sit and be a jujitsu coach. Could have been a what third degree black belt in jujitsu by now and had my own school and been doing that. Uh, right now, I've had friends who went on and did that, that I was way further on in terms of progress then. But I would, every time I think about that and I look at their gyms and I get on their Instagram page, I was like, man, that kind of sucks. I don't, I, I don't personally like that. They do. And if you are a male who is looking for a female companion, you need to be asking yourself, this is the category of people that I'm trying to get in. And these are the type of things they, they enjoy. And these are all types of things that can aid me on my growth oriented journey. You are not going to become a lesser person if you learn and take up dance and get good at a style of dance. That's going to help you just with movement and health and make you happier. Same goes with anything else I just listed. And so then eventually you are going to meet someone and someone's going to be like, wait, you do all of these things and they're going to be at least into one of them. It's just statistics. But I have buddies who are single who are growing and and they're in their 30s now and you know they make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and are over six feet and honestly are smart guys, you know. But I can't imagine them really getting with a really conscious woman because what the hell are they gonna do with them? Other than if they fall into that dominating mindset and that's not where you wanna be because you're always struggling, it's always this game. You wanna meet with someone as an equal. You don't wanna be doing that other game. And that's probably what he's ended, going to end up doing, finding someone and just kind of ruling over them. You don't wanna be a master. All right, this has kind of turned into dating advice with Ian Kanak from Right Conscious. But I can tell you guys about my wife. I, you know, when I look back, when I was younger, when I was in my early 20s, I couldn't gain, I couldn't get these high quality matches in the growth oriented field. I, I, it's impossible. 
my height, my confidence, my whatever really wasn't working in terms of finding those types of people that I wanted. And just kind of by chance and just because I was into certain things, I got better at poetry. I studied yoga. I went to India, became a yoga teacher, got into art and music and all these different things just for my own accord. But I also knew that there was a community there that I enjoyed. Like I enjoyed going to these events and being with these people. And for years, nothing worked, you guys. Just more unconscious women, just bad relationships, narcissists afloat, man. Just my life getting destroyed and terrible people, terrible ex-girlfriends. At times for years, I was totally single. No, no, Nothing was working. Couldn't even find anyone to date. But eventually, everything came together. And it was like, wait, you write desert poetry? I write desert poetry. You do art? You play guitar? You like Dune? You like animals? You like yoga? Spirituality? The list could go on. But there were these massive matches there, over at least 10 or 15 of them, that I had consciously developed over six or seven years. And I'm planning to spend the next 70 years with my wife, you know, until we die. Because and there's endless amounts of stuff to do and endless amounts of fun and experiences and uh, kids and stuff. All that's going to happen. But imagine if I just never, if I just chose to keep being jujitsu Ian, being Ian who was just, you know, skiing and doing jujitsu, being standoffish, not really learning about communication or doing these things. If I met my wife, she wouldn't have even talked to me, honestly. <laughs> she barely talked to me anyway. It was I was reaching up to get her anyway, you know, in terms of like the numbers. And so to conclude, I want us to look at Cormac McCarthy's works. I think that you can make this a positive. I think that you understanding Cormac McCarthy and being into him and learning his writing style can actually be beneficial for you pulling yourself up as an insult and for this insult culture. You don't have to view his works as these violent, weirdly sexual fetishized things that aid in this weird analysis of society ending. You could rather see him as an artesian of words, as a person who took his life by a sheer will of force and pulled himself up by his bootstraps and said, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to commit to. And I'm going to be great at it. But along the way, what was Cormac doing? Cormac was getting good at architecture and science and drawing, pool, learning a second language, being a socialite, traveling. I mean, the list goes on and on. Why do you think there's stories of Cormac having a bunch of girls and being a ladies man when he was in El Paso? How about in after he divorced his third life, um, him going to bars and picking up chicks when he was in his, what, his 70s? That's because he had a lot of experience. That's because he went beyond himself and, yes, was committed to writing, but was a very diversified individual. And that's what I want you guys to be. Instead of building on that resentment, take that energy and place it somewhere else. And I guarantee you, it will not just make you happy and make your journey of loneliness either, uh, excuse me, easier. Eventually, you'll be able to be a part of that pool, have people that you want to date, want to date you. And then we can pull out of this dumb incel culture. So what did you guys think? What did I miss? Obviously, there are probably some things that also in McCarthy's work promote incel culture. I'd love to hear them. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.